We are going to read a passage out of Galatians 5 today that has been kind of the intersection of so many different points in my life lately. Randy's teaching through Galatians on Wednesday nights. I've had separate friends bring different passages in this chapter to me recently, and so it was kind of hard to ignore as today approached. So beginning in Galatians 5 verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, in these next few moments, Lord, would you bless both myself, Lord, those listening to further understand what your passage teaches us about your kingdom in our lives and about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thomas Paine in, 70, in 1776 wrote an article in a newspaper called The American Crisis. And he began that article by saying, these are the times that, what? Try men's souls. These are the times that try men's souls. He could have been writing about today. When I sit down to write a sermon or a series or a class nowadays, I am almost overwhelmed by all that is transpiring around us. Every morning, I walk out my door to see what chapter of Revelation we're about to experience that day, right? And I look through Revelation, and I come to chapter 11, which deals with two witnesses. It's uh, Moderna and Pfizer, I believe, are the two witnesses that we find. <laughs> chapter 12 deals with the woman and the dragon. And oh, wait, that's just my wife trying to get my daughter ready for school, and not quite, uh, not quite all that I imagined for that day. When you get to chapter 20, and you're talking about the thousand years, which is probably how long it will take you to get into an emergency room if you go there right now. Chapter 19 is rejoicing in heaven, which means that football is back next weekend. Can I get an amen there? That's what I'm talking about. But all around us, not to make light of terrible situations, but sometimes you just got to laugh to keep from going crazy. At every turn, there is tragedy. 17 inches of rain in Tennessee that's sweeping away children. Hurricanes in the Northeast, an impending hurricane this morning in the Gulf. Fires in California, heat wave upon heat wave in places that are not prepared to handle it. COVID rampaging through our schools, through our hospitals, through our minds. You know, I wish more people would post stuff on social media about vaccines and masks. Those are the ones I really enjoy. Don't you enjoy those? It really changes my mind, too, every time I read those new perspectives. Um, and then this week, the death of American soldiers and innocent Afghanis in just a ridiculous attack. Next weekend, I'm supposed to teach a series of classes up in Orlando on the problem of evil. God and the problem of evil. And I look around me and there is no dearth of information with which to talk about these are the times, said pain, that try men's souls. At least they try my soul. And all around me are people who seem so sure about how to live and so confident in what's true and what isn't and so ostentatious about what's really happening. And I'm over here like, is anybody else not sure about everything? Because I am not sure about everything. Like, I have questions and I need to understand and I don't know who to trust. And it feels lately like the fate of our lives and our families and our nation hinges on every decision that we make. I feel like I've de decision fatigue, decision overload. Somebody said something online yesterday that said, normal's not coming back. Jesus is coming back. And in, in a post that made me feel both depressed and encouraged. <laughs> normal's not coming back, but Jesus is. Well, 
Not only are these the times that try my soul, they're trying my patience as well. They're trying my sanity. They're trying what's left of my self-control. I don't know about you, but every day I fight to hold a tight rein on my tongue. There are many conversations lately in my mind with people I don't agree with. I always win those conversations. They're my favorite ones, right? But the frustration is an echo of something deeper that's going on inside of me. And Paul would say that my flesh is battling for supremacy with the desires of the Spirit. One is trying to outdo the other, and though one is decidedly stronger than the other, I have apparently not yet ceded full control so that the Spirit can do its work. There's a desire within me to satisfy this flesh. And Paul is not talking about our skin here. He's talking about more of this natural bent that we have toward the satisfaction of our most basic desires. And that's where Galatians 5 resides. It resides in that decision-making space in the intersection between what the flesh wants and what the Spirit wants. And it says, in all of us, there is going to naturally be a battle there. Years ago, when I was in the hospital, uh, they gave me, a, they, they put me on a painkiller called Dilaudid. I didn't have any idea what narcotics were all about. I'd never had painkillers this strong. Uh, Dilaudid is said to be five to ten times stronger than morphine. The first time they gave me that drug, my legs went limp, and I did not like it. I did not like the feeling of it. But as they would continue to dose me up over the next few weeks, uh, I would kind of take a liking to it. I mean, it it, it obviously and quickly uh, reduced my pain. One night in the ICU, they put me on a, it was called a PCA pump, which was basically a thing where I had a control and I pushed a button, and when I pushed a button, it would release some of that drug into my system so that it would satisfy my pain if I, if, if I had any. The next morning, after sleeping through the night with that thing, they asked me if I was okay, if my pain was tolerable. tolerable. I said yes. They told me I pushed that thing nearly a thousand times overnight. <laughs> That's, that was the first warning I had. Uh, I know that stuff did some crazy things to my brain. Because one night I was laying in the ICU and two guys walked in and asked if I wanted a sponge bath. I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I was messed up, right? Uh, well, I say all that to say this. I've never been a person given addiction of any kind. But when I got out of the hospital, I thought about that drug. I thought about it. I thought, you know what, if I came across that somehow, some way, somebody were to offer it to me, it might not be the worst thing in the world. I didn't pursue that desire, it's, but I never had gotten out of a hospital or a doctor's office before and thought about a drug. Never thought about it before. It was a different kind of desire. Two weeks of consistent use had developed in me a desire that I never thought was possible, and though I didn't pursue it, there are thousands and thousands in our country who have. In 2019, more than 50,000 people died of opioid over overdoses. There is a battle in each one of us, says Paul, battles between the desires of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit. Why are they in conflict? Well, he tells us they're in conflict so that you are not to do whatever it is that you want. So that in these times when I'm being told that this is how I should live and this is what I should do, I don't just tell that person off and tell them how I feel about what you should do and how you should live. But there's a reservation there of control that's prodding me through the Spirit. And the truth is, it's a good thing for us that those desires are in conflict because if they weren't in conflict, that would mean that you don't have the Spirit in you and still you're a slave to the flesh that runs amok and does whatever it wants. And so, though those desires and, and battles, are no, they're not enjoyable, at least you're conflicted about them. And Paul will give us a very simple solution for how you deal with that conflict, and he will tell us that we are to live by the Spirit, except that's not very simple at all, because if you haven't noticed, one of the least discussed topics in churches everywhere is the Spirit, even though He's part of the triune God. We talk plenty about the Father, we talk plenty about the Son, much less about the Spirit. In Acts chapter 19, 
when Paul discovers 12 baptized men in Ephesus who had not received the Spirit. It says, Paul said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. How crazy is it to think that years after the inauguration of the age of the Spirit, you could still find believers who hadn't heard of Him or received Him. These men had only received John's baptism, not that of Jesus. And so, Jesus' baptism was one of water and spirit. It's equally crazy today to think that there are believers across the nation for whom the Spirit, they've hardly heard of it. They hardly know how it works in their lives, how He works in their lives. At best, the Spirit is discussed occasionally or alluded to in casual conversation. At worst, He's ignored completely for lack of knowledge and understanding. I've said before that I really believe in the churches of Christ where we're told to work, worship in spirit and in truth. We're heavy on truth, y'all. Like, we're not quite as heavy on spirit. That's just the natural way that we seem to be. In every church of Christ I've ever been in, it's not that we don't talk about the spirit. It's not that we don't have understanding about the spirit, but we seem much more invested, much more conversational, I should say, about truth than we are about Spirit. Yet Paul is telling us that we are to walk by the Spirit and live by the Spirit, not just dabble in it, not just seek occasional advice, but that with each passing moment and each passing day, we are to be so in tune to the Spirit that we default to what He desires rather than what we desire in all of the decisions that we have to make. And it only makes sense to me that my decision fatigue might not be so bad if the decisions that I was making on a day-to-day -day basis were a reflection of what the Spirit is saying to me rather than what I would prefer to do. I want that. I so desperately want to live in the Spirit in a way that my decision-making is not becoming more burdensome, but it's becoming easier because I'm not really the one making the decisions. So, for just a few minutes this morning, I want to think and talk about this idea of walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, and see if we can understand it a little more completely. So first of all, I would say, what is walking by the Spirit? Well, Paul actually defines it himself. Uh, let's go back. Let me see where we're at. I'm stuck, Sean. I'm stuck on this thing. There we go. There we go. Uh, in Acts chapter, or in Galatians chapter 5, starting in 16 and eventually getting to 18, uh, we will be told that if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You are not under law. And what that means is that as I'm not under the law, I'm not earning my way into salvation. As I'm living in the Spirit, the Spirit is producing desires in me that the law wants, and so I'm not having to earn my way into heaven. That's part of how I walk by the Spirit. And so when I talk by, when, about walking in the Spirit, I'm going to talk about walking under law, but I'm also going to be talking about being led by the Spirit. Paul says that I am led by the Spirit when I am walking by the Spirit. And what that means is that it's not our own power, it's the power of the Spirit. What I, let's, let's think about it like this. It's kind of like a train. It's kind of like a locomotive. And everything attached to that is being pulled by the locomotive. The Spirit is like that in our lives. And when we are connected to Him, He is leading us. When we are connected to the Spirit, He leads us in the way that He desires. But see, the problem comes because when we get disconnected, we don't sense that leading in our lives. When we disconnect, that, that really becomes a problem. Lots of people have disconnected long ago mentally, emotionally, and can't understand why they can't sense the presence of the Spirit in their lives. We are to be led by a power that is not ours but by the very power that resided in Christ. Uh, and so we walk by the Spirit and eventually begin bearing fruit that the Spirit gives to us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And so when we walk by the Spirit, one, we're being led by the Spirit, and second, we are bearing the Spirit's fruit. We are bearing this fruit. Now, now, you spend time around people all day. I spend time around people all day. And when you get to churches and you spend time around people, you don't have to be a genius to figure out which ones are bearing fruit and which ones are not. The people who are encouraging, the people who are optimistic, the people who are, who are having godly conversation, the ones that are positive, like generally I can find that that person is bearing fruit, but then you find people at church who are decidedly different. 
and they are constantly angry or in insecurity or in despair, and, and, and this is a pretty visible evidence that the flesh is winning out over the Spirit. But again, the emphasis here is, what on the, is on what the Spirit does. It's not on what I'm doing. And so I would ask you, like, are you a person who conveys that you're bearing fruit, or are you a person who conveys that you're kind of resistant to that? Are you always negative? Are you always down? Are you always angry? Are you always insecure? Are you doing things in your life that are motivated by your own insecurity? And so we find, even in the the midst of the church, even among people in church, we find people who are both bearing fruit and then those who really aren't. So walking by the Spirit is being led by the Spirit, and it's bearing fruit in the Spirit. And so another question then is, why is it important to walk by the Spirit? Why is this important? We addressed this a bit earlier. Uh, Again, one answer I think is found in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What's the flesh? It's not the physical part. It's this mental you, this emotional you. That's the problem. It's the part of you that feels like you have to use whatever is at your disposal to fill the void that you fill in your life. That's what the flesh is. And Paul will kind of go on to define this for us a little later on. He will go on to define this for us when he talks about the things that are contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. He says the works of the flesh are these, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So this is not an exhaustive list. There are things in my life that are works of the flesh that are not defined here in this list. I think cynicism is one of them. I think I I, I react to some of these times cynically. So much bad stuff happens, and I hear so many differences of opinion and differences of truth and disinformation that I grow cynical as to what's happening in my life and in the world today. Paul says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul wants us to understand that our desire for the things of the Spirit ought to be greater than these things. Someone at this point might get a little worried because I would imagine some of you have been involved in some of these kinds of things. And and somebody might say, well, Sean, I've been involved in some of this. I've participated in some of these things. Yeah, so have I. So have I. So have all of these people here. Why? Because that's why it's called a battle. That's why we all have a natural battle between the flesh, of the desire of the flesh and the desire of the Spirit, because we've been, all of us, involved in things like these. The idea is that you're not living like this, right? Like it says in verse 21, Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some verses say those who live in such ways will not inherit the kingdom of God. I talked in class this morning, and I talk uh, now about, and I talk with my youth about how there's a huge difference in sin and living in it, right? There's a huge difference in my lying and my being a liar. I'm going to lie. It's going to happen. There's a battle there between the flesh and the spirit. But when I'm living in sin, now we've got a problem. Now we've got problems. There's a difference there in doing it and in living in it. And Paul says, you are not to live this way. You are not to live your lives in these kinds of ways. So there are going to be defeats along the way. But the desires produced by the Spirit should consistently be greater than the desires that are produced by the flesh. It takes a greater desire. Just like Reese read earlier, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So there's this greater desire. It's flesh or it's spirit. I go to the gym most mornings. Most mornings, I drop off my kids. I go straight to the gym so I can get into the office by nine. Like some guys love working out. That is not me, not me at all. I used to enjoy it. That is just not the way I am anymore. I'm kind of past that. Today, I usually work out alone. Many, many days, I'm laying there just cursing the fact that I'm in the gym when I could be doing something else, but I have a greater desire, right? I have a greater desire that's pushing me, and that is the desire to not be fat. And so I go to the gym 
every day because the greater desire is winning out over the lesser desire. It's not, I don't want, it, I'm doing what I don't want to do so that I don't want that being what I don't want to be. Uh, I think one of the worst ways to approach sin is to just focus on not doing it. That's a terrible strategy, right? You've got to have a greater desire, okay? Uh, I, have, I, I have a mild addiction to Coke, right? Like the soda, not the white powdery stuff. And so, like, I, I had this mild addiction to Coca-Cola in which I know that, I know that it increases my weight. I know it does. But I want to drink that stuff. And so I constantly got a battle in the flesh. Am I going to have like four Cokes today or just one? Like how many am I going to have here? Because I know what it does to me. I've got to have a greater desire to escape the desire that I have for Coca-Cola, a a desire to not be overweight, a desire to be healthy. Um, So walking in the Spirit helps us fight against the flesh. But verse 18 reminds us again that when we are led by the Spirit, we are not under law. Why is it important to walk by the Spirit? So you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And, that's, and so you won't be under law. That doesn't mean you don't have to fulfill the law. It means that you are not now earning your way into God's grace or working your way into salvation. And when we read about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all those good things, how does, he, how does he finish that verse? He says that against such things, there is no law. Why? Because the things that the law wants, they're already coming out of you as the Spirit produces them. But now that we've discussed what it means to walk by the Spirit and why it's important to walk by the Spirit, the million-dollar question is this one. How do we do that? This one drives me crazy. Like, how do I walk by the Spirit? That's what everybody wants to know. Everybody's heard religious talk of letting the Spirit work in you, letting the Spirit lead you, and then gone away confused about how I actually do that. And the thing is, after doing a whole lot of study on this, I don't think there's just some huge secret that's been withheld from you over time. In fact, I think the answer might frankly disappoint you. But it seems to be answered in Galatians, the same book that we've been reading in chapter 3 and in other places. But let's begin in chapter 3 where Paul says, uh, let's get there, this. Let me ask you only this, he said, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or hearing with faith? Now, I'm going to ask you the same question. Did you receive the Spirit when you did a bunch of stuff, stuff working or by faith? How did you receive it? You received it by, you received it by faith. See, some of you seem confused. You received it by faith. You received the Spirit by faith. Some of you said, well, I received the Spirit by baptism. Listen, baptism is faith obeying. That's what baptism is. Baptism is, 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 is faith. Those things get confused nowadays. Some say, well, you are saved by grace alone through faith alone, acting as though faith is just this independent, arbitrary thing that exists without anything else. No, no, no. Faith is an umbrella under which multiple things exist. Baptism is a work of faith. It is faith obeying. And so you received the Spirit through faith. Well, you received it by hearing with faith. And then he asks another question in verse 5. Here's the question he asks in verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And so the question again for you is, does God who supplies you with the Spirit, does He supply you with the Spirit because you do a whole lot of stuff or does He supply you with the Spirit because you have faith? He supplies you with the Spirit because you have faith, not because you do a whole lot of stuff. Now, What that means is that the Spirit came to you the first time, and the Spirit keeps on being supplied in you through the channel of faith. Whatever He accomplishes in us, He accomplishes by faith. The Spirit moves in our lives as a result of walking by faith. And so the Spirit of God, He reigns over the flesh in your life when you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave Himself for you. Now, God's Spirit is supplied in an ongoing and powerful 
way precisely through acts of faith in our lives. And this is what is missing from the experience of so many Christians. And I get that, like, like this is kind of tough. I get it. It's kind of meaty. But this is what is missing in the experience of so many Christians as they seek the power of the Spirit in their lives, not understanding that the Spirit is supplied and empowered as we live and walk by faith. But see, walking by faith for many people is such a great challenge. We talked about this morning in class, we talked about practicing faith that results in a habit of faith that now allows the Spirit to work in me and to, for me to be in tune to His urgings. You say, well, I'm not really, I'm not really convinced by that answer. Okay. Uh, Galatians 5, verse 5, tells us that for, though, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. I don't think I have it on the screen, so you'll have to look it up in your Bibles if you want to. But it says, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. How do we wait for Christ through the Spirit? We wait for Him through faith. By li living by faith results in our walking in the Spirit. So let's talk about this. How do we walk by the Spirit? The Spirit came the first time, and the Spirit keeps on being supplied through the channel of faith, and whatever He accomplishes, He accomplishes through faith. I do have that verse on the screen that I was just alluding to. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for, for which we hope. How do we wait? We wait through faith. But Galatians 2 will give us a final answer. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Who is the Christ that lives in Paul? He is the Spirit. The Christ that lives in Paul is the Spirit. And how, according to this verse, does the life of the Son produce itself in, the, in Paul? How does Paul walk by the Spirit of the Son, the life of I now live in the body. I live by what? I live by faith. Day in and day out, Paul trusts God. His, his faith is in Christ in every single thing that he does. And this faith sustains and energizes the Spirit to bear fruit in his life. Listen, the fight of faith is the same as the fight to walk by the Spirit. It's the same thing. And where do we receive the Spirit? Or where do, we, where do we receive faith? If you know Romans 10, now faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the what? The Word of Christ. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. Listen, there are very few problems in your life for which one of the answers is not going to be, you need to be in the Word. It's necessary. Like, there are hardly any problems in your life for which one of the solutions is going to be, like, you better connect. You better get connected. You know, we just installed new deacons a week or two ago. Men who's, men's, men in whom we have expectations to live by the Spirit, to be connected, for the Spirit to be winning out over the battles of the flesh. Are they going to be perfect? Heck no. Gosh, no. I'm not perfect, not even close to it. Like, we expect to fight those battles alongside them in trying to grow the kingdom of God here at Gulf Coast. Uh, Let's finish off this passage, beginning with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Uh, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. But then verse 25 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, 
and envying one another. What I've found, and, and, and I think a really good definition of walking by the Spirit is this. Walking by the Spirit is how we live when the desires that are produced by the Spirit are greater than the desires that are produced by the flesh. They're greater. I have that greater desire, and because I have a greater desire, I'm now pursuing that as opposed to pursuing this. Paul's main emphasis in Galatians is that living by the power of the Holy Spirit is pursued the same way you received it in the first place. But what I have found so often in my life is the failure to open myself up to the full measure of the Spirit's work by believing the specific promises of God. And not just believing one of them or two, one of them or two of them, but in believing that all of the promises of Christ in my life are true. All the promises that are not directly about the Spirit, but perhaps about God's, are about God's provision for my future. For example, my God will supply every need of yours that says that it's said in Philippians chapter 4. There are a great many things about the Spirit which I still don't understand. Many things. But I'm fully believing that just as in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit came into me when I believed and had faith and was baptized and still lives in me no matter how active or dormant I perceive Him to be. And whether He is perceived to be active or dormant in my life is largely a reflection of how I am living by faith and how connected I am to the Word and to the Spirit that pulls me along, led by His power, not by my own. Because see, the really, really good news is, in the end, it's the Spirit that does the work. It's not you or me. And Paul says that we are to live that way, to live that way. What would it be like if every decision I made, I was able to make as a result of the urging of the Spirit that was telling me what to do? Not that I hear audible voices like that, but there is a prodding inside you when you know that the Spirit is encouraging you to do something. And so often, our first reaction, because it's so difficult, is to be like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait and see if I can get some advice from some people that is contrary to the advice that the Spirit is giving me, so that then I can do what the people told me to do, rather than what the Spirit told me to do, and I can feel good about it, even though that might not be the way to go. I don't know if you fought that battle in your heart, but I've fought it in my heart many times. Spirit says this, and I'm like, I don't like that so much. Let's go see what so-and-so has to say about it. But what's it like to live by the Spirit and to walk by the Spirit? Well, it begins in walking in faith. And that's Paul's solution. It's not flashy. But that fight to walk by the Spirit is the same fight to walk by the flesh. And so you're doing it, you just don't realize it. How well you're doing it, only you know that. But you're doing it. Or you're not, and then that's where the real problem lies. Right? All of us uh, face these really challenging times with many of the same thoughts that we just don't talk about. Same questions, the same insecurities, the same difficulties in discerning what's true and what's not. Uh, the purpose of the body of Christ is to encourage one another and edify one another and walk along one another, alongside one another daily so we can help each other fight those battles, so that we can empower the Spirit to fight that battle for us. 